Chapter 4, Introduction to Probability. In this video, we'll go over some of the key concepts regarding probability, as well as discuss the three approaches to assessing probability. So finding the probability of something is to find the chance that a particular event will occur with a probability value in between the range of 0 to 1. 0 means it's impossible, like living forever, and 1 is for certain, such as the sun will rise again. In between, we have uh, unlikely probabilities, like winning the lottery, uh, an even probability, like uh, heads or tails, which is 50-50 chance, or becoming a good student is considered likely, especially if you follow the tips I've provided in this course. Now, you learn in Chapter 1 about an experiment, and so this is where uh, we go through a process to find out the outcome that we can't predict. That's why we run the experiment. Now, in terms of probability, we have something called a sample space. This is a collection of all the possible outcomes that can result from a selection, decision, or experiment. So, for instance, on the left here, we have uh, some examples of different experiments. I can toss a coin. Uh, I can inspect a part, say a phone, for instance. I can conduct a sales call to try to sell a vacuum. Or I can roll a six-sided die. And so the sample space for these experiments are its outcomes. Tossing a coin can either result in heads or tails. Inspecting a phone can result in a defective or non-defective part. When I make my sales call, the person can either purchase or not purchase it. And rolling a six-sided die, the outcomes that might come up are one, two, three, four, five, or six. So in business, the sample space is all the potential outcomes of an experiment we might run. Let's look at an example from the textbook. Uh, problem number three, if two customers are asked to list their choice of ice cream flavor out of vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, list the sample space of the possible outcomes. So our experiment here is to find out customer's choice of flavor, and the item of interest is the ice cream flavor. So the possible outcomes for one trial or one customer are our three flavors, V for vanilla, C for chocolate, and S for strawberry. In step three, we need to define the sample space. Since we're interested in finding the sample space for two customers, we have to expand our outcomes. So here, I like to use a table to organize uh, the possible outcomes. Uh, outcome one is where uh, our first customer says vanilla, and our second customer also says vanilla. Our next outcome is our first customer continues to say vanilla, and the second customer says chocolate. So you can see here systematically where we change the possible outcomes or the combination of outcomes for our two customers. Another way you might have done this is uh, simply in your head as you try to think of all the possible combinations. I like to use a table or at least write down the outcomes so I can make sure I didn't forget one or uh, exclude one. So here, when we write our sample space, we can write the acronyms for the flavors, and we can see here that there are nine outcomes, uh, each one of these letters representing one of the flavors for our first and second customer. Now, another way to find the sample space would be to draw a tree diagram. Uh, so in our first step here, we're going to do a different experiment. Let's say I want to ask three students if they like statistics. And so the two outcomes is either an answer no, or they answer yes. And so for our sample space, we have to do three trials using a tree diagram. And so here we imagine our first student. Um, she can either say no or she can say yes. Then as we continue to draw the tree, here's our second trial or our second student. He or she can say no or yes as well. And you can see the branches start off of the trial one's answer. So for instance, the first person can say no and the second person can say no or perhaps the first person says no, and the second person says yes. And then for trial three, or the third student who gets asked, again, they only have two possible answer choices, no or yes, but it branches off of the previous trial. So you can see here all the possible combinations of three people getting asked if they like statistics. So this is just another visual way of drawing outcomes as opposed to doing it systematically in a table. Now, another term that you're going to hear a lot throughout the semester is this idea of an event of interest. So an event of interest is a collection of outcomes, specifically to something we're interested in studying. Let's say in our example, going back to the ice cream, we want to know when at least one customer chooses vanilla. So it's important we understand what at least one means. 
Uh, another way of saying that would be one or more customer chooses vanilla. And so in our step one, we define the experiment. Again, we're going to ask two customers what ice cream flavor they like. Then we're going to list out the possible outcomes for our first trial. That's going to be our three flavors, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. And then we'll go ahead and define our sample space. So this is the same table you saw before for our two customers, all the different combinations of vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry between the two people. Now we have to identify our event of interest. In this case, we want to find all the outcomes where at least one customer chooses vanilla. So looking at our table here, I'm going to look for all the outcomes where at least one person says they like vanilla. And so you can see here that there are five outcomes where vanilla is the chosen flavor at least once. And so when I write out our event of interest, we'll denote the big E here and write uh, little e one, two, three, four, and seven. So we're actually numbering our possible outcomes here and that will represent the combination where um, it satisfies our event of interest. So we can see here that there are five outcomes. It's important to understand the types of events that we're dealing with. So first is mutually exclusive events. This is the occurrence where one event cannot happen at the same time as another, meaning there's no common outcomes, there's no overlap. So for a business example, if I have a oil rig, and we'll call it oil rig number 12, and we're, we're drilling that oil well, uh, event A is that we strike oil. So here's my image of oil coming out. Uh, the other event is that we dig and turns out there's no oil in this oil rig. You can't have it happen at the same time. You either have oil or you don't. Another type of event to be aware of is independent events. This is when one event in no way influences the occurrence of another event. So here's our business example. Say I have Suzanne and she has a salon uh, in Washington, DC. And so the event that her company will be successful has no influence to Scott's men's fashion store in Seattle. These are two completely independent events in terms of uh, whether or not they will be successful in their businesses. The next type of event to be aware of is dependent events. So this is where the occurrence of one event impacts the chance of something else happening. So for instance, here's our business example. We have a small company that has three male and seven female employees. Two are randomly chosen to attend a conference. Now let's say the first person that gets chosen randomly is a female. Then when we try to figure out the chances of our next person being male, what we have to do is we have to remove that first person that got chosen. That now changes the chance of who gets picked for the second slot to attend the conference. And let's say this gentleman gets chosen. So we'll see that the probability for the second person being a male to get chosen will change after we pick the first person. Let's do a quick concept check in terms of the different types of events that we just discussed. Now when we look at the first scenario, it says you can either be at work or you can be at home sleeping. Would this be considered independent, mutually exclusive, or dependent? If you said mutually exclusive, you're right, because you can't be in two places at once. So you can't be at home and at work at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. Looking at the second example, let's say you pay for coffee with a credit card, and then the person behind you in line also pays with a credit card. Are these two events independent of each other or dependent of each other? Sometimes it helps to think about the story. Think about the last time you were in line somewhere. Um, this would be considered independent because the person behind you is likely a stranger and doesn't know you and has nothing to do with whether or not you use your credit card. So these are independent of each other. In this last scenario, you're driving 30 miles over the speed limit and you get a speeding ticket. What type of event would this fall under? If you said dependent, you're right because getting a speeding ticket is dependent on if you broke the law by going over the speed limit. Let's now talk about the three different methods for assigning probability, classical, relative, and subjective. Now, when you see the symbol P of E, this is big P for probability, and capital E to the I is our event of interest occurring. So with classical probability assessment, this is based on the ratio of the number of ways an outcome or event can occur. 
and it assumes that the number of ways uh, an outcome or event can occur for each individual outcomes are all equally likely. So think about that six-sided die. When I uh, roll the die, all six sides are equally likely to happen. So that's an example of classical probability. And so the way we calculate it is we find the number of ways our particular event of interest can occur, and then we divide it by the total number of possible outcomes. So if we look at this example here, company A has got 10 employees, seven female and three male. Assess the probability of a female employee being selected at random to travel to an, uh, a convention. So we assume all the employees have the same chance of happening. In this case, uh, what we'll do is we have to count the number of ways of females uh, can occur, so that's seven, and then we'll divide it by the total number of possible outcomes. So we'll take seven divided by 10, and that gives us 0.7 chance of occurring. And you'll you have to remember that probabilities always occur between zero and one. If you do the math and it's uh, greater than one or somehow a negative number, you've made an error in your math. Let's go ahead and do example B. It's actually on your worksheet, so make sure to follow along and jot down. Let's say a new car dealer has uh, five GM, six Ford, three Toyota, eight Nissans, and two BMW cars. If one car is selected to be placed on sale, what's the probability that it's a Nissan? Now again, we assume classical probability. That means all the cars have equal chance of occurring. That means what we have to do uh, to find the Nissan is to count the number of ways this event of interest can occur, which in this case we've got eight Nissans, and then we'll divide it by the total number of possible outcomes. So what we have to do is add up all of the cars and then divide. So if you took eight divided by 24, you'll get that the probability of getting a Nissan is 0.33. For relative frequency probability, this should sound familiar. You learned about this in chapter two when we had to calculate relative frequencies. This is based on the probability that the number of times an event occurs is divided by the total number of times an experiment is performed. So here, uh, our probability of our event of interest is going to be the number of times our event occurs divided by the number of trials, so big N. So for instance here, and this is on your worksheet, just look at problem 33, similar to a homework problem. A quality manager for Dell Computers has collected data on the quality status of disk drives by supplier. They inspected a total of 600 disk drives. Below is the inspection data in the table, which has the different suppliers or companies Dell gets its disk drives from. And we've got the status of the drives as either working or defective. When you look at this table, this should look familiar this is a joint frequency table, which we learned about back in chapter two. We'll go ahead and use this table to determine some probabilities. So in part A, it asks, using the relative frequency assessment method, what is the probability of randomly selecting a disk drive from company A? So we first need to find our event of interest. That's going to be the chance of selecting a disk drive from company A. Then we have to divide it by the number of trials. In this case, the number of trials is how many disk drives were inspected. So that's gonna be the 600 inspections. For the math, we're gonna go ahead and take the number of drives from company A. So we'll add the 120 and the 15. Notice that in the question, there's no mention of which status of the drives. So we just want all the drives that are coming from company A and that got inspected. The big N is going to be the number of trials. That's the 600. So I always do my work in parts. That way I can catch any errors and fix as needed. Whether you're using a calculator, Excel, or mental math, what we'll do is take the 120 plus 15 to get 135, and then we'll divide that by our 600 trials. When I divide these two numbers, I get a probability of choosing a disk drive from company A as 0.225 or 22.5%. In part B, we're still using the relative frequency assessment, but this time we're interested in the probability of a defective disk drive being received by Dell computers. In this event of interest, we want to know the probability of getting a defective disk drive from all the companies because there's no mention of any specific company. So we're just gonna find all of them. 
for our number of trials, it's still the 600 inspections. That didn't change. And now we'll want to go ahead and add up all the defective disks. So looking at our table, we can see here's the column for defective drives. And we'll just add up our 15, 5, 5, and 20. And then our number of trials, or 600, goes below. So when I add up the defective disk drives, we get 45. And then dividing the 45 defective drives by our 600 trials, we get a probability of 0 0.075. For part C, this time we want to know what is the probability of a defective disk drive from company C. So for our event of interest, this has two characteristics, very specific. We want defective disk drives and we want it from a specific company. Our trials is still the 600 inspections. And in this case, when we look at our table, we need to look at the defective column and the company C row. And we see the value five. So we'll plug that in the top of our fraction and divide that by our 600 trials. So the probability of getting a defective drive from company C is 0.0083. You'll notice I went out to four decimal places. Um, this is for accuracy, and also if we converted this into a percentage, when we move the decimal over, we're not rounding too early and we um, have accurate numbers. Now, the last type of probability assessment is called subjective probability assessment. This is based on a decision maker's state of mind. In other words, their opinion or expertise. So let's do an example. Uh, say the target manager is asked to assess the chances that a shipment from a new supplier will arrive on time. Now, using subjective probability, this manager might assess the probability as 0 0.75 being on time. Now you might ask, well, where did that number come from? And so this is where she's going to use her experience and her expertise to make this probability assessment. So for instance, she might use her experiences with past suppliers or um, her knowledge about the current supplier and their reputation out uh, in the market. Or uh, she might also be paying attention to weather patterns. And so if there is a big snowstorm uh, about to hit, um, she might take that into account for the probability. Uh, while the new supplier might be a good performer, if the weather is bad, that might negatively affect the on-time arrival of the shipment. And so subjective probability is just that. It's subjective. Uh, sometimes it's hard to argue, but uh, when we talk to experts, we ask them to explain all the criteria that they used to uh, come up with their assessment. Now, an expert who's using subjective probability could even use relative frequency probability by using historical data and analyzing that and then adding their own flavor of knowledge on top to come up with an assessment. So if you have any questions, just let me know.